Emily Jones, I'm an Associate Professor of Public Policy here at the school, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all here um, for a book launch, and of a book that has a, an impressive title, no less than The Future of Capitalism, um, which I think is all a pressing topic for all of us at the moment. Um, and I'm delighted to introduce Sir Paul Collier, uh, my colleague and the speaker for this evening and the author of this book. Um, he probably needs no introduction, but I'll uh, give him one anyway. Um, Paul Collier, as you, may, as you know, I'm sure, is the Professor of Economics and Public Policy at, here at the Blavatnik School of Government. He's the author of The Bottom Billion, which won the Lionel Gelber Prize and the Arthur Ross Prize, awarded by the Council on Foreign Relations. He's the author of The Plundered Planet, Exodus and Refuge. He's held chairs at Harvard University, Sciences Po in Paris, and in 2014 he was knighted and awarded the President's Medal of the British Academy. The book itself, um, if you haven't had the chance to read it, I encourage you to do so. Um, George Akerlof, Nobel Laureate in Economics from 2001, said this about the book. He said, the future of capitalism is the most revolutionary work of social science since Keynes. Let's hope it will also be the most influential. These times are in desperate need of Paul Collier's insights. So please join me in welcoming Professor Paul Collier, Collier to the podium. Thank you. And Professor Collier has kindly agreed to speak for about 40 minutes or so, and then we'll open up to questions and answers. So please um, have your questions ready. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for all coming on such a lovely evening, right? I know you've got alternatives, so I'll try and say something that's useful. But it's not going to be so useful that it's a substitute for reading the book, right? <laughs> a book is a book. Um, the, um, uh, the subtitle of The Future of Capitalism is Facing the New Anxieties. And that's really what the book's about. That it's, a, it's, a, it's about how neglect of important economic forces has produced new anxieties, um, why we neglected them, and then the, the most important part of the book, which I'll probably talk least about, is how we can actually effectively address these new anxieties and heal our society. And it's not just about Britain. The same process is happening in pretty well all Western societies. So, it's called the future of capitalism, and um, that has to be our future in the, in the broad sense of meaning capitalism as a, a decentralized process of economic decisions with competition. Um, it's the only system we know that actually delivers rising prosperity, um, but it can't be left on autopilot. Um, Capitalism periodically derails, and sometimes it derails very, very badly. Um, the, the first time it derailed um, was, uh, was in the, the 1840s. Um, and let me describe that briefly. It was um, capitalism, as Adam Smith described, people coming into factories, peasants coming to work in cities and factories where they were much more productive than they had been on the farm. And that's what brought them in, higher productivity, higher income. But they came into cities, these cities formed, and the cities were productive to work in, but they were killing fields to live in. Because once you brought people together without any public health, without any adequate infrastructure, they started dying like flies. Right? The average life expectancy of a rural laborer in the 1830s and 40s was about 33, pretty pathetic. In the towns, it was 19. Right? These were killing fields. And it got worse and worse and worse, so that by the 1840s, um, the society was in crisis. Um, that was the first derail derailment. Um, we'll see what, uh, what happened. Um, the second derailment is, you know, almost within living memory, 
which is the derailment of mass unemployment in the 1930s. And the third derailment is within the memories of all of us. We date it from 2008, but actually it had deep antecedents that I, I would date back from about 1980. Um, and it's, uh, notice that all three of those um, derailments are very different. Right? Um, capitalism doesn't always derail in the same way, so the solutions are not always the same. But there always are solutions. Um, what's gone wrong this time? Obviously, the banks blew, blew themselves up. Um, but it's much more than that. Since about 1980, um, three big divergences have occurred, um, which are new um, and, uh, and which are, which are very dangerous. So one is a spatial divergence within, within Britain, within America, within France, within Germany, and it's a spatial divergence between a booming metropolis and broken provincial towns and cities. Um, the, um, the second um, big divergence is the emergence of a new class divergence. And it's not the old class divergence between inherited wealth and those without it. The new class divergence is in terms of education. It's those, essentially, who've got a college education and those who've got less education. Right? And those with a college es education have been on an up escalator of rising incomes. And those on the, with less education have been on a down escalator uh, in which their skills are getting less and less valuable. So those are the two big divergences within each of the major Western countries. And then there's a third global divergence that I'm not going to talk about tonight, um, but is very real. And that's between a, a lot of countries which are converging upon the rich world very fast most obviously China, but a bunch of countries, which I called the bottom billion, um, which are still diverging and indeed sometimes falling apart. And so there's a, there's a, there's a divergence between the, 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 the newly successful rising countries, now called emerging market economies, and the, the, the countries that are that are falling further and further behind, now called fragile states. Um, what's driving these processes? Um, and um, and it's, uh, it's two processes of economic processes. One is uh, rising complexity. Rising complexity is the price we pay for rising productivity. The great centers of research in the world, such as right here, Oxford, are producing um, technological innovations, organizational innovations, which take us to higher and higher levels of productivity. But very obvious, they are not obvious solutions to higher productivity. They can't be. The obvious solutions have already been had. And so they're difficult, they're complex, and so they require new skills which depend upon having higher education, tertiary education, and then using on the base of that higher education, you acquire specialist skills. Um, in the educated class, that gives you the, the rising escalator. You're getting more and more specialist skills. Um, and you're also needing to cluster those skills together. And that produces bigger and bigger agglomerations. That's London. It's, a metro it's the metropolis where all these differentiated skills you can find together in one place. Um, so that's the complexity story. 
an upward escalator of rising skill, what, what's driving the downward escalator? And that's globalization. Globalization is good on average, but my profession um, owes the world a big mea culpa because we, we, we were sort of lazy. We said, oh, um, globalization produces mutual benefits, um, and we knew that what that meant was um, the people who gain can compensate the losers and still be better off. Right? That's the, the, the yardstick economists use. Right? And then we get off the hook. We say, okay, so that, that's for politics to sort out the distributional bit. What we're excited about is the efficiency bit. Right? And so we ended up saying globalization's good. Right? My colleague Tony Venables is one of the top three international economists on earth, um, is very conscious of this. He says, you know, we were lazy. We owe, we owe the world a mea culpa. Right? Um, because some of those redistributions that's needed to compensate the people who lose and the people who gain um, are really politically extremely unlikely. Uh, and if compensation isn't made, there is no theorem which says globalization is good. It just depends who you are. Um, and it certainly wasn't good for everybody. It certainly wasn't good for the manual skilled in developed countries. They were on the down escalator. Um, uh, and an example of that is my own hometown of Sheffield. Um, Sheffield had had a steel industry a cluster of specialist steel uh, for about 700 years. It was actually mentioned in Chaucer. There's a line in Chaucer, this knife, a Sheffield knife. Right? Um, and it, it, was, it was killed in about five years in the early 1980s. You'll all, or nearly all of you will know about it. You'll just have not connected um, because you, you, many of you will have seen the film, The Full Monty. It was such a good film with such good scenes that you'll have forgotten that's Sheffield. Right? Um, there are much sadder cases than Sheffield. A few months ago, I was invited to Stoke, um, the, which was the World Pottery Center. And the same thing happened there, but in an even more devastating way. Um, so we've got this. Um, globalization and complexity which are producing the move to bigger and bigger metropoles like London. Globalization, of course, leaves fewer places able to be the world's best because more and more things are competed on world markets rather than national markets. And so the more and more of these cities that were either national clusters or even global clusters get knocked out um, by the emergence of East Asia. So complexity and globalization have produced a pattern of winners and losers um, with very big gains in the, for the skilled in the metropolis um, and some very painful losses for the unskilled in the provinces. Um, by uh, by a fluke, I actually straddle um, all three of these divides. Um, the most obvious one is that I, I straddle the, the rich, the, the, the developing world that's catching up and the poor countries that are falling apart. Because 90% of my day job is basically working on the poorest countries that are struggling to avoid falling apart. Um, and yet I live in some of the most prosperous societies in the world. Um, but as you heard, I grew up in Sheffield, so I straddled the spatial divide. Well, my family is still in Sheffield. So the, the tragedy of Sheffield as a broken city was a tragedy for my family. Um, and then I straddle the, uh, the education divide. Uh, I, I kind of epitomize the, the highly educated 
um, rising escalator. Um, I've had a, an increasingly comfortable life. Um, but both my parents left school when they were 12 um, and had no opportunities in life. Um, I haven't got a copy of the book to show you, but in some, when you open the book, there's a picture, there's a photograph. Um, that's just a, Here we go. You won't be able to see it, but it will tempt you to buy it. <laughs> and, uh, and this photograph is of two little children aged about four. Uh, and one is me and one is my cousin. And we were born on exactly the same day. Um, and at four, we were really very much the same. At 14, we were very much the same. Um, uh, poor kids who'd managed to get to, to grammar schools. And then we diverged. I went sort of onwards and upwards. Um, and she, 14, it was 1963. Those of you who like Philip Larkin will perhaps remember what he said about 1963. Sexual intercourse began in 1963, which I seem to remember Larkin said was, was just too late for me. Well, it was certainly too early for me. Um, so. But it wasn't for her. Um, and so she became a teenage mother. Her daughters became teenage mothers. And this is sort of a, a cumulative, um, an acutely painful and avoidable divergence. Right? And that's why, if you get around to reading the book, you'll find the book is, is actually, it's, it's pragmatic and it's analytic, but it's actually got an edge of passion because I've lived through these divergences and I feel we've got to do something to, to, to heal them. Um, so, those were the divergences. Why were they not addressed? And that, that's, that's a very, very important question to ask. They, they, they've been a slow burn the last 40 years. It's been these con pretty well continuous divergences. Why did governments not do anything about it? And remember, over the last 40 years, both the left and the right have been in political power. So what happened? Neither of them addressed these new anxieties. Um, and I think both the right and the left got captured by new intellectual agendas that diverted them from what had originally been something pretty close to common purpose. So let's start with the right. Um, where, where was the right before Thatcher and all that stuff, right? Um, and we go, let's go, let's go back to the 1840s because actually that's where, as it were, the, the compassionate right emerged. Um, and uh, in the 1840s in the northern cities, remember, they became killing fields, right? Um, the boom city of Europe in the 1840s was Bradford. Uh, and the mayor of Bradford was an industrialist. He'd invented a new technology. He became fabulously rich. Um, Sir Titus Salt was given a knighthood. And, uh, and Sir Titus Salt was mayor of Bradford in, 19, in 1849 when cholera struck. And so Bradford became not just the usual killing field, but a devastating environment. And he was a socially very concerned liberal mayor who that inspired him to become, in effect, the first Bill Gates. So he became a, a massive philanthropist, gave all his fortune away, partly to clean up Bradford, but also to establish the first new industrial town, built to be healthy city, healthy town. That was Saltaire. And a, a few decades later, that got copied. Cadbury, Leverhulme, and its, its modern incarnation is John Lewis. And that's the tradition 
of a business, business with purpose, business with a sense of obligation to workforce and obligation to a community. So that was the tradition we had. And where did that tradition morph into? Where did it get, it got hijacked. And it got hijacked by two forces. One was um, from, the, uh, from, from the, 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 the Freedmanite uh, right in America. Friedman famously came out with the proposition that the sole purpose of the firm is to make profit. That's all it needs to do. Because as long as all the firms make profits, you know, this, this wonderful Mickey Mouse version of Adam Smith, which is actually a complete travesty of Adam Smith, that profit seeking would produce um, everybody better off. And that, that was the cliche that summarized that was greed is good. Yeah? Greed just meant you were, you were driving harder to make profits and so you were driving everything up. Yeah? Um, and then you get a, another tr tr trend, also on the right, which is the sort of libertarian right. And the libertarian right basically says, we don't need a state. Right? Um, it denigrates the state. It, it starts with, with Ronald Reagan saying government is the problem. Right? Um, so that's what's going on in the right, on the right. Um, and, uh, and on the left, you don't realize neither of those movements is in any way capable of using public policy to fix these anxieties. Right? It's just public policy is off the agenda. And on the left, so again, let's go back to the 1840s. And the same place, the cities of northern England, the same crisis that was producing this social tragedy and the same response. Peasants had come into cities, my goodness, they got new anxieties, right? Where are we gonna live? Very obvious concern that we tend to forget is, I'm going to die soon, and am I going to get buried? Right? And so, ordinary workers banded together to build a new form of, of institution, began in Rochdale. And that was the cooperative movement. And it was reciprocal obligations. Very like what Salt built with his workforce, reciprocal obligations. He had recognized he got obligations to his workforce. When he died, the whole of Bradford turned out at his funeral. There's a statue of him in Bradford. You know, he was seen as a, as a fine man to whom they could be loyal. Right? So reciprocal obligations, both on the right and on the left. Right? What, were the pra the, what did the cooperative movement seek to fix? It seek to, sought to fix things like where, how you're going to get somewhere to live? Halifax Building Society, which grew to be the biggest bank of England. Right? How you're going to be buried? The cooperative funeral service, which became the biggest funeral service. Right? So that was the tradition. It was addressing real anxieties it was finding pragmatic solutions to those anxieties, so it wasn't ideological. And it was built upon this idea of reciprocal obligations. The genius of reciprocal obligations is that the same machine that's producing rights is producing the obligations to meet the rights. Right? And what did the left morph into? Well, again, two trends. Um, on the right, it was Friedman and the Libertarians. On the left, it was the economists. My own tribe got in the act. Um, and we embraced uh, utilitarian philosophy. Why did we embrace utilitarian philosophy? In honest, the honest answer is so damn convenient because economics had developed a technology, a mathematical technology, for maximizing stuff. In order to maximize stuff, you need stuff to maximize. You need something that you can add up. And the utilitarians provided utils. People got utility, and we, we had a little model of 
What were people like? Well, they were greedy and lazy. Um, and so they got utility from consumption and they got disutility from work. Right? So that was the basic economic description of, of man. Um, uh, greedy, completely selfish, and lazy. Right? Now, of course, economists, as human beings, know we're not like that. It's just that that's what our models do. Right? And then we just maximize the utils. Um, and because um, people, individual people, are greedy and lazy, um, if it's just left to them, things will go wrong. There'll be, there'll be rich people and poor people. And so what we need is some um, platonic guardians to just redistribute the, the, the consumption so that we'll get more utils here and we won't lose many utils over here. Right? And that became um, the agenda for social democracy, exemplified most clearly in new labor. Right? Let the city rip, tax it, and put the north of England on Benefit Street, right? Because all the, all the people need is consumption, right? That's obviously a complete travesty of what human beings are by. Human beings are about dignity from work, self-respect from work, but also human, human beings are moral agents. They are perfectly capable of taking responsibilities and obligations. Um, I'll give you a, a great little result from, uh, this, this is recent work, work in social psychology, and you can all try it tonight. Right? And it's a survey which asks a very simple but actually rather brutal question. Think back on your life, what are the three things in your life that you most regret? Right? In a quiet moment and light, try it and write it down, right? So the psychologist got these responses and then clustered them into, into classifications, right? It's quite clear what sort of regrets we should have if we're all economic man, you know? If only I'd bought that house, if only I'd bought Apple shares, if only I hadn't messed up that job interview, right? They'd be material concerns. They don't feature at all, right? Pretty well everybody their three biggest regrets are all of the same form. I let somebody down. You know? We are moral creatures. Um, anyway, so that wasn't recognized by the economists. The economists disagreed with Plato in one respect. Right? Plato created this idea that because ordinary people couldn't be trusted, you needed um, these, these super guardians who would actually take the decisions. Uh, but he thought they were philosophers. And economists put him right on that one. Right? Um, uh, then we get another trend on the left, which is uh, contributed by the lawyers. Uh, and that comes from rules and the idea of rights, and especially rights for groups, and especially rights for victim groups. And so um, what these two forces have in common, the, the, the intellectually they're very different, the, the, the Rawlsian lawyers and the utilitarian economists, but what they have in common is what they do to obligations and rights. And in both cases, the, remember we started with reciprocal obligations. The obligations match the rights. They were amongst people. But what happens with the utilitarian machine and the, and the Rawlsian machine is the obligations go up to the state. And then what showers down from the, from the state, you know, the gentle rain from heaven, um, are the rights. But the showers uh, are stronger in some areas than others. You know? um, and so we detach the process of obligations from the process of rights. It's, it's, it's the, the moral equivalent of printing money. Right? We can recreate rights detached from any proper process that's matched to people being willing to take on obligations. So that's what goes on on both the right and the left. In each case, they move away from this pragmatic agenda of 
meeting real anxieties. They're both actually ideologies. Um, what's the consequence of that? It's that the anxieties go unaddressed and so they turn into anger and what happens when people have got real anxieties that are unaddressed and they become angry, they mutiny. They mutiny. And that's what Brexit is, it's what Trump is. They're mutinies, right? As with all mutinies, they are not about what happens next. Right? They are not forward-looking things that bring their own solutions, right? Some of you will know about mutiny on the bounty, right? If you remember what, where the mutineers on the bounty ended up, they ended up on Pitcairn Island, stuck in the middle of nowhere, right? So they weren't mutinying in order to go and live on Pitcairn Island, right? They were mutinying because the ship, the bounty, uh, was, you know, they, they, they regarded as intolerably um, uncomfortable and they were mistreated. Um, but because those anxieties have been unaddressed and people are angry, then that's a political opportunity for the extremes. And so we get around the Western world the extremes of the right and the extremes of the left talking the right talk, talking the talk of the new anxieties. The extremes of the right and left are neither capable of coming up with solutions to the new anxieties, nor even do they intend to. That is not their real agenda. We know what the agenda of the far right and the far left are. They're nothing to do with the anxieties that people have. Nothing. Right? But they are flourishing because they're the only ones who are actually even talking the talk of addressing the new anxieties. So, um, what can be done? Um, uh, what there, and my proposition in the book, and most of the book, is that there are practical solutions to these problems. They're not unfixable problems. Um, by pragmatism, I don't mean make it up as you go along. Pragmatism is a very solid philosophical tradition, goes back really to, to Hume. Um, and um, and the, 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 the proposition of, of, of pragmatism is that there are no permanent utopias. There is no manual that will tell us how to get to utopia and we then stay there forever. The proposition of pragmatism is we're in a, a dynamic world that is each time coming to, to new problems that we've not had before, maybe won't have again, and there isn't the timeless manual which you just have to look up and it solves everything. You've got to work it out in the context of the time. And so you've got to use evidence of the, the present context and analysis to come up with a, something that works. Just as we did in the 1840s. Right? In response to those killing fields, in the second half of the 19th century, we came up with practical solutions, public health, regulation of factories and so forth, big, in, big infrastructure investments, that cleaned up cities. In the 1930s, we eventually, a little belatedly, but we came up with Keynesian economics that worked from about 1945 to about 1970, which I regard as a sort of golden period. Um, and then it, then it didn't work anymore. anymore. You know, it's, it's sort of de it, it itself derailed. Um, so what can be done? Well, you pay your money and you take your choice in terms of whether you think I've got solutions or not. Um, uh, Emily was kind enough to read out um, the, uh, the assessment of, of George Akerlof, the Nobel Prize winner in economics, who seems to think that I've found some useful solutions. Um, or you can 
um, take Dominic Lawson's assessment in the Sunday Times um, on Sunday, which um, probably none of you have read, but um, uh, he, he said, if this is the solution, um, there, isn't a, there isn't a future to capitalism. The, the solution's worse than, worse than the disease. Right? So, um, so let me, let me sketch um, three or four solutions, probably, probably three, um, and I can only sketch them. Right? Uh, and I'll start with the, with the no-brainer, the obvious one, and that is um, that uh, Britain in particular, but quite a few other countries, but Britain in extremis has mismanaged uh, our uh, education system for people over the age of 16. Um, we have got, put huge resources into those who want to continue with developing their cognitive skills, which is now the, the half of the population with the, with the best cognitive skills. And at that, we are just superb, you know? I mean, Britain has three of the top 10 universities in the world, including this one, um, and that's the highest ratio relative to population anywhere in the world. Yeah. So we do the, the, the cognitive stuff brilliantly, right? at least in the, in, the, in the better universities, not everywhere. What we utterly fail to do is the more difficult transition. So if you're not in the, most, the half of the population that's most cognitively gifted, right? what you have to do is switch track completely from cognitive skills to non-cognitive skills. That's harder. Not only is that harder, but you, the people who are doing it are less cognitively gifted. And so it's especially harder. Right? And so that's where we should be putting our biggest resources. And instead, it's been pathetic. Um, there is a model of what we should do, um, and it's pretty close to hand, it's Switzerland. Um, Switzerland, 60% of young people take that non-cognitive vocational route. Why do they do that? First of all, it's very prestigious. It's at least as prestigious as the cognitive route. Some of the chief executives of the Swiss banks took the vocational route, not the cognitive route. That's despite the fact that Switzerland also has a top 10 university. Right? Um, so 60% of Swiss children choose to go the vocational route. Partly it's very it's equal esteem. It's a four year training course with recognized credentials, four years, and probably most important of all, Students are paid for those four years, and half of all the costs are borne by firms. If firms are paying half the costs, they make damn sure that people come out of those four years knowing something, you know, being productive. Right? So that's the elementary thing that we should be doing. Right? It's a no-brainer, right? And then let's go both sort of downstream and upstream from that. We'll go upstream to the, the pre-16s, the pre-16s. And the tragedy here um, is that we, and, and we, again, we're at one extreme, uh, we have neglected the obvious point that the people best suited to raise children are their parents. And that is so politically incorrect to say that, you know, if it wasn't for my confidence in the dean of the Blavatnik School, I'd fear a dismissal notice, right? But it's, there is overwhelming scientific evidence for that banal proposition that the best people to, to bring up children are their parents. But bringing up children, if you're a couple of 19-year-olds, 
who, you know, who didn't plan to, for, for anybody to get pregnant, but they did. Um, that's tough. That's really difficult. And what we need from that moment onwards uh, is what I call social maternalism. We do not need more social paternalism, the top-down authoritarian stuff um, that basically tries to, to wag fingers at young families. We need massive amounts of support and mentoring all the way along from pregnancy through to 16, and actually a little beyond. Right? Um, I'm very conscious of the, the value of mentoring. Um, Mentoring comes as a, as a hidden asset in the social networks of the successful. Um, there's a very good book by Robert Putnam called Our Kids, um, which compares the social networks of the successful and the unsuccessful. Um, and uh, the, the, uns the unsuccessful win in only one active, in one occupation, janitors. Right? And the most extreme divergence is professors, right? The successful all know professors and the unsuccessful know none. Um, when I was 17, um, I desperately needed to ask somebody because I wanted to know whether to come to Oxford to read law or to read economics. And I couldn't find anybody in my family who was in any way equipped to give me advice. And so I asked my dentist, and he was completely useless. <laughs> I needed a mentor, and I didn't have one, right? Um, so that's social maternalism. You support children from birth right through to 16, and then you give them vocational training, and then what? And this is the final point. Um, people want to work in the place where they belong. And they belong where they've grown up. Um, recently, I was invited to address a, a big public audience in Stoke. And um, uh, the, the people who invited me were telling, telling me, Stoke is, is a desperately sad place because all the bright children in Stoke just leave. They just leave. They don't want to leave, but there's nothing for them. And a humane form of globalization brings jobs to where people belong, not people to where the productivity is. We move productivity. There, the market forces, uncorrected, will drive everybody to the vast metropolitan agglomerations. That is actually inefficient because the big metropolitan agglomerations become congested. And so this is a case where market forces um, drive us in the wrong direction, as incidentally they do with vocational training. The, if we leave vocational training to the market, firms won't train. It's much more sensible to poach somebody else's trained worker. Yeah? And so we know from training you've got to have active public policy. We know from rearing or failing to rear, rear children, that you need active public policy. And in reviving, bringing in knowledge clusters in broken cities, you need active public policy because it's a huge coordination problem that in the, the default option is all the knowledge clusters basically end up in the big metropolis. Very inefficient. Active public policy, and there are examples from Ireland, from Singapore, active public policy that produces these knowledge clusters. And so it's perfectly feasible to do, it's just that we haven't done it. My final point, which suffuses the book, but which I've not had time to talk about, is ethics. And that, that the book is about the ethics of reciprocity, reciprocal obligations, within families, within firms, within the national society. Um, and we need, at all those three levels, state, firms, families, we need an ethics of reciprocity. And what we've got 
because of these divergences, is a society that's being pulled apart. We desperately need to restore that ethics of reciprocity. Thanks very much. Tour, uh, tour of your book there. Absolutely magic, thank you. We have about 30 minutes now for questions. Um, perhaps we'll open up the floor. I think we've probably got mics on the floor. Yeah, and I can already see a hand straight up there at the bottom of the foot of these stairs here. I think that's Valfa there. So let's take that, that question from over there. Thank you. Please do briefly introduce yourself. DPhil student here. Thank you so much. Uh, really looking forward to the book. Uh, it, I'm sure it's going to be incredible. Um, so I wanted to just ask about one thing that you didn't talk about as much, I think, tonight, which is the relationship between finance and banking and the real economy and how your kind of central arguments relate to um, reform and transformation in that particular domain. Good question. Um, so the book does discuss these things. Um, in a talk, you can't do everything. Right? I think I already overran my time, so Emily was desperately signaling shut up. Um, um, the, um, let me give you one little um, well-researched finding about uh, bankers. Um, uh, and this is done in experimental games. Um, so. Experimental games are very clever things. You can, um, you, you can run games where you can measure whether people cheat or not um, as a group. Even though you can't say you're the one who cheated, you can know whether people in the group cheated. And because nobody knows, we can't identify who, it's sort of it doesn't contaminate the, the individual decisions. So this has been done for a lot of professions. And you can, the, the psychologists who do this thing can prime an identity. That is, they can try and bring one aspect of your person to the top of your mind. They can talk about, um, you know, your kids, and they can bring up to the top of your mind the idea that you're a parent. Right? Equally, they can talk about your profession. And so what's top of your mind is your profession. When they do work that with bankers, when they bring to the top of the bankers' minds the fact that they're bankers, they increase, they cheat more. Right? When they think of themselves as bankers, the norms that are dragged into their mind are norms which say, good to cheat, isn't it? Right? Smart to cheat. And that is a devastating comment. Right? A number of, it's not just, it's not unique to bankers. Um, uh, I'm sure I'm going to tread on people's toes, but um, accountants, you know, when I grew up, accountants were the most upright people you could imagine in society. Um, and we've had a series of appalling scandals in which um, the culprit was the auditors who signed off on completely bogus accounts. Um, and, uh, and so, there's, there's been a, an erosion in professional cultures. Um, the, in, there's a companion book coming out by my friend and colleague Colin Mayer, who is professor of finance. Um, it's coming out in November, I think, called Prosperity. And we're doing a joint lecture series for the British Academy around Britain. Um, so I've gone light tonight on firms because that's very much the, the theme of his book, is the collapse of ethical purpose in firms and the vital importance of recovering it. So it's the theme of my book as well. Um, and, uh, but I've just gone light on it tonight. Can I just push you a little bit there, Paul? If, what, what then should we do with the financial sector? Because I think you talk extensively in the book about mutuals and cooperatives. I mean, that, is that what we need to think about then, the bit share, ownership and shareholders? And who, what the incentives are then in the financial how sector? How repurpose firms? Um, first of all, it's, it, the decline in purpose is relatively recent. It's sort of the last 50 years. It's back to Friedman. 
Um, uh, and so um, it's not intrinsic to capitalism. People actually prefer to work for purpose. Right? Um, an example I give in the book is uh, Imperial Chemical Industries, ICI, which in my day was the most admired company in the country. Um, you know, it was one of the finest chemical companies on earth. And then around 1990, it changes its mission statement from we want to be the finest chemical company on earth to um, our mission is to maximize shareholder value. Whoever got up in a morning saying, today I'm going to maximize shareholder value, right? I, I, I gave this lecture in Pakistan in February, and a, an old guy came up to me and he said, I was a senior manager in ICI, so I prepared to apologize. And instead, he held out his hand, he said, I saw that company being destroyed by this absurd mantra of maximized shareholder value, which deflected us from a sense of purpose. Um, we've had the same phenomenon um, with sh taking away discretion from jobs. Just as economists have tried to do, um, to say we don't need people to have a sense of purpose because we can just use carrots and sticks, lawyers say we don't need purpose because we can just write it all in a contract. And what, we, what that produces is the sort of tick box performance we see in social services where people are, you know, you go into a situation, you identify 20 different observable characteristics of the situation, you then look down the manuals and say, ah, this is the decision. And so all discretion is shredded. Because you know autonomy, you cannot have a sense of purpose in your job. And the same has happened to teachers. So we can get back, um, and we can get back partly with public policy, heavyweight public policy that says we need to change the board composition of firms, and we need to change the, uh, the legal requirements on board members. Um, but you can also change it from a, a much more sort of decentralized process of individual leaders resetting, uh, resetting norms. Great, thank you. I can already see many more hands going up. So let's, let's take, uh, so there's, three in, there's three in the middle here. So the lady up there with glasses, yeah. And then there's two gentlemen. Maybe we take the three questions to, together. Hello? Yeah, yeah. sorry. I'm Michaela. I'm a DPhil in politics here. I very much enjoyed the talk. I was wondering um, if we, you could perhaps comment on a set of arguments that I think have become more current of late and that also speak to issues of the failures and crisis of capitalism. And in particular, I was wondering if you could speak to concerns that actually class inequalities are growing, but not because of this educa educational divergence. Um, indeed, it seems like many graduates who are at the top institutions are not finding jobs, so that might not necessarily lead to the inequalities um, we're seeing today, but that we're seeing profound divergences in wealth and incomes, and that that inequality has um, grown steadily and um, also uh, accelerated um, following the 1980s, notably with changes in the financial sector um, and the possibility of greater wealth accumulation for a few that that incurred. Thank you. Just behind you, if you don't mind to pass the microphone back. Thank you. Uh, Andrew Woodcock, local resident. You mentioned Stoke, Bradford, Sheffield. We might add Liverpool, Glasgow, and a host of others. Was the decline not really inevitable because of loss of empire? We lost an empire, failed to find a role, and perhaps, at least as importantly, did fail to find new markets for what these great cities were producing. Question just, yeah, gentlemen, just two rows front. Um, okay, then, yep, yeah, that you can go back. Sorry, we'll come back to you in the next round. She's just walking back with the microphone. Yeah. Is there? Yep. Yeah. Whoever the mic's nearest to, yeah. Grab it while you have the chance. Uh, thanks. Um, I'm, uh, my name is Jamie. I'm a DPhil student at Blavatnik and one of Paul's supervisees. Um, so you, you talk about reciprocal obligations. Uh, it seems now that in most of the kind of countries in the West, people are starting to uh, find other people like 
it's becoming more tribal. People are developing hatred for each other in their group. Um, do you have any practical solutions, not just in terms of the kind of policies around education, but how can you recreate uh, like common cultures within communities? Yeah. Three meaty questions, therefore. Okay. Um, good question. So, wealth uh, and income inequality. Yeah. So, this is partly consequential upon the erosion of a sense of reciprocal obligations in firms. Um, if we look at the ratio of uh, median earnings to chief executive earnings in finance, um, uh, that's grown from 20 to 1 to 500 to 1, with no change in overall performance. Right? But clearly, that move from 20 to 1 to 500 to 1 constitutes a, a huge erosion in, in ethics at the top. Um, and it, if we want to develop a sense of, of reciprocal obligations, we have to be able to generate a we. And you can only generate a we if your language, your narratives that say we're all in this together are consistent with your actions. And if you're, it's no good saying we're all in this together if at the same time you're moving your own pay from 20 times average earnings in your firm to 500 times average earnings. You're not all in it together. You can't, you're, not in, you're not able credibly to use we. Right? And so that's the bonus story. The other big, big driver of wealth, which I've not had a chance to talk about, but is a big thing in the book, uh, is metropolitan land and metropolitan skill. The metropolis has made both, both that location and skills in that location hugely productive. And people actually think they, they sort of earn that. There's a, um, a famous theorem in economics called the Henry George theorem, which says who, who gains from that agglomerate, that, the, those gains from agglomeration, who captures what's called the rents of agglomeration. And Henry George said it's the landowners. Um, Tony Venables and I in work just published at the beginning of this year showed that that's actually wrong. Once you introduce skill into the story, uh, a lot of the gains are captured by the highly skilled in the metropolis. Um, the, you know, the sort of highly educated lawyer um, who's living in a bedsit. Um, uh, they don't pass much of the gains on to the land, landowner, as it were. Um, but those two groups, the people who own the land and the people who have the skills in the metropolis uh, are, the new, uh, are the new rich. Um, let me, and, and they should be taxed. I mean, the, the, the point about economic rents in an, in an agglomeration is they're just that, they're rents. They're not earned in the sense of being deserved. They're not a return on effort. They're a return on all the things that's made the agglomeration possible, which is all of us. And so rents need to be taxed and taxed heavily. Um, they're the equivalent of oil. Uh, the new North Sea oil is London. Uh, um, the, is, so if you talk very eloquently there about taxing London and redistributing to the provinces. Yeah, but to not, to put, la, not to put the London provinces port. on Benefit Street, ah. but to, to finance the creation of clusters. Now, your oh. question is, was, and that feeds straight into, was Stoke inevitable? Um, I mean, the decline of Stoke. Um, and I think there's two reasons why we, we can say no. Some of these activities would have crashed anyway. Some wouldn't. Um, if we look at Germany, um, Germany has managed to retain um, pretty well, you know, most of its, most of its uh, high-skilled manual clusters. Um, so we lost them. We lost them to Asia, but Germany didn't. And the reason why Germany managed to keep them was it moved up the manual skill escalator thanks to very effective vocational training. Not, I think, as good as Switzerland, but, but in that ballpark. And so you can, up, you can put your non-cognitive skills on a rising escalator just as you can put your cognitive skills. But we didn't. They did. Um, and that ties me into the second point, which 
We have this enormous asset of our universities. We have some of the best universities in the world. So if the future of high productivity is knowledge clusters, we've got the, as it were, the, the engines that are generating those knowledge, the, the, the knowledge that can then become those clusters. And we've done a very poor job of providing a connection between the, the fundamental research, which is generating the knowledge, and the um, entre enterprise in the, the cities that most need it. Um, we could do a much better job with that. Um, tribal hatreds, um, yes, obviously. Um, I mean, this is you know, the, the ultimate fantasy of the, uh, of the Silicon Valley uh, group was that by producing all these social media, um, they produced one big global happy family. And what they produced um, is echo chambers of hatreds. Uh, I mean, you know, these people are technologically savvy and socially completely ignorant. Right? Um, they still believe in uh, right? what we need is state and nation. The right believes in nation without state, the left believes in state without nation, and Silicon Valley believes in neither nation nor state. It's all Bitcoin, you know? Um, what can we do about the tribal hatreds? These, all these social networks have what is called nodal actors. That is, this huge asymmetric uh, power of communication in these networks. There are celebrities who communicate with millions and most ordinary people communicate with 150. Right? And so the people who are nodal actors in these networks have a huge responsibility to make sure that the narratives that they peddle and the, action, the visible actions they take are actually actions which heal rather than divide. And they don't realize that they've got those responsibilities. So partly I just want to create a, a movement that pressurizes the, the, the celebrities, as it were, to behave more responsibly. Great, thank you. Let's take another round of questions. I promised this gentleman the mic, and then I'm going to go to the yeah, lady at the back, and then there wasn't there another hand? Yeah, lady here, and then the gentleman there at the back. Sure. Thank you. Uh, my name is Les Klein. I'm a member of the public. Um, it seemed to me that some of your solutions would require a significant amount of uh, public investment, for example, the vocational training. And it also seems to me that since probably the Wilson years, what you call the end of the golden era, there's been a lot of reluctance to have uh, increases, in, certainly in personal taxation. In fact, the move's been to reduce from, what was it, 90% down to 40%, 50%. And so if the personal taxation can't be increased, and if businesses who are not as responsible as they used to be are reluctant to uh, give you more money or threaten to move out of your country, how are you actually going to, in the short term or next few years, how are you going to fund the required solutions? Yep. Great, thank you. Yeah, lady just there with the glasses, yeah. Uh, it's Christine Gehora, also a member of the public. Um, um, I wasn't sure how you characterize the crisis in terms of the global south, given that in 2008, you know, before 2008, it had, stagnated. Is it the case that uh, due to the stagnation it uh, was sort of immunized from what is happening in the rest of the world? And also, uh, just a follow-up question to that, does it then mean that the, does the crisis then present an opportunity to bring the global south to perhaps the same level of disadvantage as the rest of the world in trying to address uh, the issues? And then the next round, I'm going to come right onto this side. So, sorry, you haven't had the chance for the mic for a minute. But, yeah, just here. And then we'll, we'll let Paul answer, and then we'll come to that side of the room. Hi, I'm Paolo. I'm an MBA student at the Business School. And I'm from Chile. And if you uh, look at the history of, recent history of Chile, in the last 40 years, we moved from poverty to almost being a, a developed country in every in, in every metric that, do, that you want to look in life, quality of life. My question is now, uh, the metropolis that you're talking about are again at a really different speed, uh, Berlin, London, San Francisco, 
So what do you, how do you see the, how do you see the future of the developing, developing countries, the countries that were, that were almost there, now that we are slower than, than this metropolis? Thank you. Yeah. The, um, okay, so the public investment point. Um, yeah, you're quite right. Um, also note that, indeed, tax rates in the, you know, the, 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 that period, 1975, 1945 to 70, were, were right up there, 83%, that sort of level. Um, people grumbled, but actually people paid them um, because we were coming out of having fought a, this massive war together. There was a great sense of shared identity around shared purpose, and so reciprocal obligations were, were accepted um, and they transformed lives. You know, we got the, the National Health Service, et cetera, et cetera, it was, it was, it was, it was transformative. Um, the, um, and we've walked a long way from that. Um, business as part of, um, of repurposing business Business has to pay sensible taxes. I mean, it, it is, um, uh, it is in completely indecent that uh, companies like Google and Starbucks and stuff pay 3% corporate tax rate. It's, it's just indecent. You know? um, and, uh, and they need to be shamed out of this sort of behavior. Um, the, how, how uh, might we, I'm just thinking about how might we do that, though, because I understood your question well. It's that if you want to tax the city of London, they've threatened to move. So we've got a problem where the polity, if you like, and the instruments we've got are nationally based, but a lot of these companies are then global and footloose. So yeah, so I, 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 I was brought in for the British G8 of 2013. Um, and indeed, David Cameron, who I work with very closely, um, uh, said to me, what, what is going on with Starbucks? You know, what, what, what are they doing? So I explained to him, and he, he, he got it straight away. He said, so the message should be, you know, we need proper firms, which means get rid of all these shell companies. And so he introduced a compulsory public register of all the companies in Britain, true beneficial ownership, revolutionary move, yeah? proper firms, uh, proper rules, and proper taxes. Um, and, uh, and he... Uh, he, I was with him in Davos shortly after that, and this you know, global businessman who smugly think they're saving the world, um, and he said, um, we expect you to pay your taxes, smell the coffee. Right? Um, and uh, that, was, that was quite a brave thing for a G8 leader to say in front of global business. You know? He said, the only way we can get corporate taxes moderately low is if everybody pays them. Um, now we've got to move in the OECD um, base erosion and profit shifting. So it's starting to spread um, because uh, even, the, even America is now sort of waking up to the fact that it, it, it doesn't advantage anybody um, if corporations uh, evade tax. Now, of course, America's a little bit peculiar at the moment, so we'll see. Um, the global uh, south, yeah. <laughs> But where is the tax to come from? It's, a t it's a, the big idea in economics, and it's very much in this book, is we shift from taxing effort, we tax rents. And there are huge untaxed rents in metropolis. You just look at the rise in asset prices. And, you know, price of land, price of property, um, we're just supposed to have done something revolutionary by introducing a 3% tax um, when uh, foreign owners of property in London uh, sell, right? 3% capital gains tax. Um, I mean, this, this is absurd, you know? It's absurd that, um, you know, I'm a professor at Oxford. I pay a marginal tax rate of 45%, and some billionaire in Chelsea pays 3% on his capital gain. I mean, this is, this is just you know, crazy, actually, politically crazy. Fortunately, when things are politically crazy, it's relatively easy, once you make them prominent, to change them. That's how we got changed the, the Shell Company stuff with the G8, because once it was prominent, nobody 
was willing to stand up and say, it's a good idea to keep the true, true ownership of companies secret. It's a good idea to keep the bank accounts that they own secret. The only people who benefit from that are crooks, and the crooks didn't want to stand up and say, please can I keep my account secret, right? And so once you make these things prominent, they fall like a house of cards. Hence what we achieved with beneficial ownership. Um, a quick answer on the Global South, it's a huge topic, and then I want to take a couple of questions got, from the yes, other side and before we wrap The up. Global South question, um, and the Chile question, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm going to apologize. Um, I've got stuff on it in the book, but over this, this, this last summer, I read a new book, it's called The Eye of the Needle, which will be coming out this time next year. Uh -huh. Hopefully I'll launch it this time next year. And it, that directly answers your questions, right? This is, the, the reason I'm ducking it tonight is that this is my day job, talking about answering those questions. Um, incidentally, I think two or three people have said rather apologetically, I'm from the general public. You're the people I most want to talk to. I, my, my first email this morning was a, somebody said, I'm 19 and a care worker in Exeter, um, but I've read your books and I want to ask you about something, you know? And that's the sort of email that makes me feel proud, you know? So an invite to come back in a year by the sound yeah. of it and get all the yeah. answers that you're, that you're longing for. We'll we save a the... seat at the front for Yeah, you? absolutely. So let's take yeah, two questions from the front, yeah, and then. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Raymond Falk. I'm uh, an architect and environmentalist. You, you said that there wasn't a manual for how to make the world work. There is, in fact, a manual. It's called the Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth from Richard Buckminster Fuller from the 1960s. I just wonder whether you might be familiar with this, and if not, whether it might be worth having a look at it. It's not a long book. Um, it does get to the heart of a lot of the issues that you've been touching on, a lot of the issues are touched on by people in your kind of situation in trying to find ways to make the world work. One thing he doesn't deal with, which I'd like to raise with you, is the conflict with our system of democracy. There's a kind of an inbuilt sort of contradiction where we want democracy, and nobody wants it more than I do, or, or indeed that Buckminster Fuller would have wanted it. But how do you reconcile the problem of the short-termism of democracy with the need for long-term solutions where politicians have only got their eye on the next election. I, I could go on, but I mean, that's yeah, a, a very yeah, fundamental yeah. question. If that could be solved, we might get ways of making the world work for everybody. Great, right. and then we'll have one yeah. last question. Yeah. We'll let you answer that, Mama Swampo. No, no, go on. Yeah, there's a gentleman sitting down to the back there, yeah. Thank you for your talk. I have a question in regards to, you mentioned that one of the things that needs to change probably is the structure of boards of companies so that they have more representative interests, just not the interests of shareholders. And uh, I think the labor proposal was to do something along those lines, to have like a third of the board of large corporations to be represented by the workers. And the interesting thing is that this proposal is being painted as socialist. You know, this is the end of capitalism. Um, I'm sure Germans would be surprised to uh, realize they're living under a socialist system because that's the rule there. Um, so I think my question is, I think uh, the left has a lot of uh, interesting solutions to a lot of the things you've talked about today. But my concern is that they're often just uh, painted as, oh, these are just the being extreme people, right? Well, they're actually proposing real um, solutions. Interesting. Yeah, so look, let me just think on both. The, um, the democracy and short-termism, um, uh, you know, um, governments have elections, but people have children. And so ordinary people, voters, naturally think long-term. Yeah? And, um, and so a perfectly viable discourse for a political party is to talk about the long term. Um, the, the politicians who talk short term, and it's certainly not confined to Britain, I mean, some of the 
short-termism in, uh, in Germany has been terrible. Right? Um, uh, but the politicians who talk short-termism uh, actually insult voters. Um, because all of us who have children, naturally our horizons are, are long-term. Uh, and so it's not an inevitable feature of democracy, I think. Uh, it's an inevitable feature of lousy political leadership. One of the things this school was created to do was to produce a more educated vintage of political leaders around the world. Um, and um, we're, I think we're doing that, right? I think the people who leave our school are actually not the, uh, going to play the, the short-term uh, political card. Um, finally, the, um, uh, on, on boards, um, the, I, I, I want to get away from the, the issue of which party's got the right answers. I don't think either of the parties have got, um, uh, have got serious answers at the moment. Um, certainly Labour's talking the talk of the new anxieties and it's coming up with you know, some solutions that sound right for a couple of minutes and maybe, maybe even a bit longer. But um, the, I've got a discussion in the book on how do you actually get boards to, to, to be repurposed, which is very important. Um, it's not enough to repurpose a company. Um, there, are, there are about five different things you can do that all push a company towards a better sense of purpose. But if you're dealing with boards um, and the composition of boards, I'm skeptical of putting, um, as it were, a, a British Trades Union on a board. I think that's, given a lot of the history of British trade unions as very oppositional identities, um, the tradition of German trade unions who are indeed on boards, but the tradition of German trade unions is very much grounded back in that reciprocal obligations world. And so um, it's not good enough just to have a, a third of the board that's saying, ya yeah, boo, you know, we hate the company. Um, you've got to have, uh, so my own preferred solution is to change the legal obligation on all members of the board so that all members of the board should be required to consider the public interest, the local community interest, and the workforce interest. Um, and uh, we'll just finish with um, going back to responsible capitalism. Um, uh, the, the firms that last longest tend to be the most responsible firms. And in America, one of those firms is Johnson & Johnson. And there was an old Mr. Johnson who in 1943 set down the, the ethical principles of his company. He, he set them in, in stone. They're still there, called Our Credo. And, um, um, and there, were, there were four big principles of which, um, of which profits to sustain the company were ranked the fourth, the least important of the four. And it went workforce, community, uh, and society, basically. And then in, uh, was that all just bullshit? It turned out not to be. Uh, in the mid-1980s, um, somebody went and put poison in Tylenol, Tylenol bottles, which was Johnson & Johnson's best-selling product. Some mal malicious stuff, doubtless there was going to be some blackmail uh, coming out of it. And what happened straight away, this doesn't sound as remarkable as it was at the time, but straight away, local Johnson & Johnson workers just went into the supermarkets, took all the title off the shelves, said to the supermarket, don't worry, you'll be fully compensated, you'll be fully paid. And it cost Johnson & Johnson 100 million in liability because they admitted this liability. They were the first company to actually say, when that sort of stuff happens, we take responsibility. We didn't put the poison in, but we're going to be responsible for the consequences. Um, why did ordinary workers do that? 
And the management then eventually, then subsequently said, yeah, that's the right thing. Why did they do it? Because they knew from that credo that their first responsibility was actually to their customers. And so you can get ethical firms which really do establish a, an ethical norm. I think John Lewis has done the same thing. Um, so I don't want a board to be an oppositional battle between one faction and another. I want a board to be united in trying to serve multiple purposes. Profits are necessary because if you don't make profits, your business is not sustainable. But they're not the objective. They're a constraint, not the objective. Thanks very much. Great, thank you. I can see there were a lot more um, hands. We didn't get the chance to uh, hear your questions. But I can invite you upstairs after this for drinks. I believe your book's going to be on sale. Is that, is that right, Paul? Um, I have no idea, but if it is, I'll I'm sign I'm looking it. at some, somebody to nod. That, but please join us upstairs in a moment. But before we do that, please join me in thanking Paul. That was absolutely brilliant. Thank you.